Whether or not they are justified, whether or not they are necessary, and whether or not they make sense, experience tells us that wars are never cheap. On 7th October 2023, Hamas, the terrorist group that controls the Gaza Strip, carried out a bloody and vicious attack against Israel. Not surprisingly, the Hebrew state was quick to respond, and its prime minister assured that all members of this terrorist group had signed nothing short of their own death warrants. <laughs> A war then began that lasts to this day, which, by the way, makes it an unusually long war, very long, for what is customary in Israel's history. But let's look at some examples. The Lebanon War in 2006 lasted 34 days. Operation Cast Lead in 2009 lasted 22. And Operation Protective Edge in 2014 lasted 50 days. Even the 1973 Yom Kippur War lasted a mere three weeks. In this case, however, we are up to more than 145 days. And what can I say? There is no prospect that the conflict will end anytime soon. But I know this is visual economic and not visual politic. Relax, it's not that I've made a mistake in putting on my uniform. The point is that Israel is winning this war. Its military superiority is overwhelming and its performance on the battlefield has been even more efficient than expected. But that is not to say that the war is not having some complications for the Hebrew state. Do you want some clear proof of what I'm talking about. Israel's economy contracted at a rate of 20% after the outbreak of war. Okay, this headline from the Financial Times is a bit confusing. Israel's economy contracted by 20% in annualized terms. That is, if the result of the last quarter of 2023 were repeated in the rest of the quarters of a full year. But even so, a 5.2% drop in GDP in only three months is truly barbaric. Especially when the government is also spending hand over fist on all kinds of military contracts. And don't forget, that in the short term, increases in public spending increase GDP. Well, not even that is happening. It turns out that 5.2% of Israel's GDP is equivalent to about $25 billion. And then we have to take into account the increase in public debt. So, visual economic community, if one thing seems clear, it's that the war in Gaza is costing a lot of money. A 5.2% drop in GDP is something we haven't even seen in Russia. And therefore, I think the question is very clear. What on earth is going on in Israel? How is it possible that Israel's economy has plummeted more than 5% in just three months? Well, the first key is to be found in the country's military reserve. You see, the Israeli armed forces are considered one of the most powerful in the world. However, we're talking about a country with only 9.5 million inhabitants. So, how does Israel manage to have such powerful armed forces? By maintaining a huge military reserve. Between the Mili, compulsory military service, and the compulsory service, Israelis spend an average of more than 20 years in the armed forces. More than 20 years. So in this way, following the October 7 attacks, Benjamin Netanyahu's government not only mobilized the military, but also 300,000 additional reservists, who logically had to temporarily leave their studies or their jobs. Overnight, a significant chunk of the labor force throughout Israel vanished. It's an impact that, in the case of the technology industry, the most important and lucrative of all was between 10 and 15% of the total. Outrageous. And on top of these figures, already shocking in themselves, we must add the tens of thousands thousands of displaced people and the parents who had no one to leave their children with because of the mobilization and the closure of schools who logically were also unable to go to their jobs for weeks and that's not all there are times when if one worker is absent others cannot complete their work the production chain breaks down well, to give you an idea, according to the Israeli Ministry of Labor, in total, almost one in five workers were unable to do their jobs for weeks. In other words, many companies suddenly found themselves with massive production problems. At the same time, consumer spending plummeted 27%. It stands to reason that if someone in the family is on the front lines, the last thing you feel like doing is going out to spend, go out to restaurants or shopping. In such a situation, your priorities change, if for no other reason that your financial situation will worsen. And of course, for the nearly 500,000 troops deployed, going out and spending was also not an option. And this is where we get into a chain effect. If people suddenly stop spending, in the short term, there is a demand shock. Business turnover plunges and government tax revenues collapse. Just think of all the sales tax revenues going up in smoke. 
But that's not even all. The company's problems did not even end there. Following the Hamas attack, Israel imposed super strict restrictions on Palestinians entering Israel to work every day, a number that had been growing steadily in recent years to over 200,000 workers. Now, many of those workers, about 150,000 according to estimates gathered by the Financial Times, are no longer able to enter Israel, which has done a whole lot of damage to sectors such as construction. So between one thing and another, labor shortages have become a serious problem for the Hebrew economy, a real disaster. And bear in mind that the only reason things have not been even worse is because exports have fallen much less than imports, which have plunged by almost 50%. But of course, the cyclone is not over. Why? Because the war has boosted public spending. How much? Well, hold on to your chair. In the last quarter of 2023, public spending soared almost 90% over the previous three months of the year. We have already told you that wars are not exactly cheap. Now, in 2024, the budgets include a deficit of almost 7% of GDP. The question is that, as you can imagine, such a huge increase in public spending has consequences. And the first of these is that the government has to finance it. How? Well, here's a clue. Israel plans $60 billion debt raising and tax rises to fuel defense spending. In Israel's Ministry of Economy, the alarm bells have gone off. Israel has been one of the most prosperous countries in recent years, but now the war has become a very heavy burden. And the biggest issue is that it is not even known how long the war might last and whether or not it will be extended to Lebanon to fight Hezbollah. So just in case, they have started to take action. Israel will issue $60 billion of public debt this year, which is 20% of all the public debt that the country had accumulated over the decades before the Hamas attacks. We're talking about more than 10% of the national GDP. For now, Moody's rating agency has already begun to downgrade Israel's sovereign debt rating. The ongoing military conflict with Hamas, its aftermath, and its broader consequences materially increase the political risk to Israel, while weakening its executive and legislative institutions as well as its fiscal strength. Which, of course, did not endear them to King Bibi. The downgrade is not related to the economy. It is entirely due to the fact that we are in a war. The rating will go up again the moment we win the war, and we will win the war. Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel. Whatever the case, the government will also completely freeze the hiring of public employees and increase taxes. They will increase VAT and taxes on banking and tobacco, and maybe many other items in the not too distant future. <laughs> Of course, this huge debt issuance that you can see the government expects to make and the rating downgrade will make not only government debt, but also corporate debt more expensive. It is a question of country risk and the expulsion effect. You see, on the one hand, the cost of public debt tends to act as a benchmark because it is generally considered the least risky asset in a country. So if the cost of public debt increases, private debt tends to become even more expensive. But on the other hand, if the state begins to absorb more of the available savings, then the funds available to companies are reduced and they have to pay more for them. In other words, companies have less and more expensive financing. This is the crowding out effect, pure law of supply and demand. Well, this, along with the increase in taxes and the stoppage of many foreign investments due to fear of war, may further erode the Israeli economy. Now, let's put the brakes on. Does all this mean that the enormous prosperity that Israel has enjoyed in recent years has come to an end? Well, let's not go so fast. The number of mobilized reservists has already been greatly reduced. And as long as the war does not spread to Lebanon, there should be no need for a general mobilization again. That could give Israel a lot of economic oxygen. After all, its powerful technology sector is still there. The economic fundamentals are there. If you look at the high-tech sector, it's there. If you look at infrastructure investment, it's there. If you look at private consumption, it's there. What's more, the Israeli government has done its homework in recent years in such a way that today, the public accounts are very healthy. For example, at the time of the Hamas attack, the public debt was below 60% in a context in which the economy was growing at rates of over 4 and 5% per year. So, once the worst of the gale seems to have passed, things should normalize. Even so, so, no, sorry, but this is not the whole story either. Now, another problem could emerge with the Gaza exit plan. Let me explain. The Netanyahu government says it expects to maintain a significant military presence in Gaza for quite some time. That could mean a permanent increase in government spending, debt, and taxes. 
We believe that there will be an increase in defense spending in Israel in the coming years. That's why we have taken the fiscal measures right now. In the short and medium term, this could slow down the economy. In fact, the governor of the Israeli central bank himself has already sounded the alarm. The budget gap of almost 7% is not sustainable. If public spending is not cut and revenues are not increased, things could soon start to deteriorate at full speed, further increasing country risk and the cost of financing government and business. And guess what? Right here, we come to the biggest threat facing the Hebrew economy by far. You see, Israel has been one of the best performing Western countries in recent decades. For example, while in the 1980s, Israel's GDP per capita was about half of that of Germany. Today, according to the World Bank, 12% higher. We're talking about a country that is 11 times richer than its neighbor, Egypt. That has more unicorns than all the other countries in the Middle East combined. And that accumulates more Nobel Prizes than China. So pay attention to this assessment. Well, a a large part of this enormous economic success has a name, the technology industry. In the world today, there are countries that are mainly exporters of raw materials, such as Russia or the Democratic Republic of Congo. There are industrial powers, such as Germany or China, countries with a very high level primary sector, such as New Zealand, or territories specialized in tourism, such as the Dominican Republic. And then there is Israel, which is becoming above all a gigantic technological power. For instance, along with the United States, States, it is the world's largest software power. But I want to pause here for a moment because the numbers are purely and simply spectacular. The Israeli technology sector is by far the leading economic activity in the country, both in terms of turnover and labor generated. And the average salary in this industry is well over $6,000 per month per worker. In total, almost 20% of the country's entire GDP depends directly on technology companies, a percentage that is growing steadily. In fact, for comparison, in the United States, the land of Silicon Valley, Google, Tesla, Nvidia, etc. This percentage barely exceeds 9% half that of Israel. And what does all this have to do with what we have told you in this video? Well, you see, the secret, the key to the enormous economic growth that Israel has had in recent decades lies in this industry. An industry that, given its current enormous size, needs three things. Capital, international partners, and talent attraction. So, what is the problem? Well, the war raises the country risk and reduces both the available capital and the number of people who want to invest or move to work in Israel. In other words, less funds, fewer skilled workers, and much higher financial and labor costs. The cost of debt increases, and if you want to retain high-value workers or attract new ones, you are going to have to pay them much more. But do you want a concrete example? Draw Bin, the head of the country's innovation authority, says Israeli companies are now finding it extremely difficult to work with foreign investors. Indeed, the Startup Nation Policy Institute has put data on the table. New Israeli startups raised just $1.3 billion in the last quarter of 2023, an amount that may seem very high to you, but is almost 50% less than in the same quarter of the previous year. In fact, it is the lowest funding figure raised since 2017. Well, in this video, we have told you what is happening with the Israeli economy and what is behind the huge collapse of its GDP at the end of 2023. But not only that, you see, the biggest risk for Israel is that if the war drags on, it could have permanent consequences on its economic and productive fabric. For Israel, fighting does not come for free. But having said that, now it's your turn. What measures would you take so that the war would not end up sinking the Israeli economy? Have you ever considered the enormous cost of military conflicts? Leave us your impressions in the comments and let's start a debate. And you know, if you found this video interesting, don't hesitate to give it a like. Thank you so very much for being there. All the best and I'll see you in the next one.